Also on five o'clock, I was told. Good talk. Well, I make it five. Should we? Should we start? A number of guests, duly introduced by fellows, beg leave to attend your meeting. Is it your pleasure that I welcome them in your name? Minutes. And a very warm welcome to all of you, to the fellows and the affiliates in the room and online. And if you're not part of our community yet and would like to be formally engaged with us, please do see me after the lecture or indeed contact us via the website. So to the minutes. Society of Antiquaries London, Ordinary Meeting, Thursday, the 12th of October, 2023. Burlington House and online. Dr. John Cooper, Director in the Chair. The minutes of the ordinary meeting of Thursday, the 5th of October, 2023, were read and signed. The following being in attendance and having signed the application. Sorry, give me a second, Maria. Yeah. Okay, I'll try that sentence again. The following being in attendance and having signed the application required by the statutes was duly admitted as fellow. Laura Maitland. The following communication was then laid before the society, The Wood That Built London by Chris Schuler. Thanks for returned for this communication. The director announced that the next meeting would be on Thursday, the 19th of October, 2023, then adjourned the meeting, a reception followed. Is it your pleasure that I sign these minutes as a true and complete record? We now come to the main business of today's meeting, which is to hear a paper, Mills Whip Projects, London Civil War Defences, Rewriting History by Mike Hutchison and Peter Mills. Before I introduce our speakers, some housekeeping. There will be a Q&A session at the end. We will be taking questions in the room and on Zoom and YouTube. If anyone would like to ask a question online, please type it in the chat function on Zoom, YouTube, and I will ask as many as we can at the end of the lecture. So to introduce our speakers this afternoon, Mike Hutchison studied archeology span at the University of Newcastle, then worked on a major villa site in Lincolnshire. Following a brief career as a drummer in a post-punk band, we have extensive notes about that, but I'll, maybe we can discuss that in the reception, he joined the DUA at the Museum of London. He directed numerous sites, including a significant excavation at the Tower of London. He subsequently was project manager for major infrastructure projects, including the Limehouse Link Road, the Jubilee Line Extension, and the Channel, Channel Tunnel Rail Link. He joined Mills Whip in 1998 as managing director and has advised widely across the UK on projects from Northumberland to Somerset. Peter Mills started in archaeology in Colchester, then York, before going to University in Liverpool. After graduating, he worked in Hampshire and Nottinghamshire before coming to London and eventually working for the Museum of London. His excavations have included sites at the Houses of Parliament, Westminster Abbey, the Old Royal Mint by the Tower of London, and a number of smaller excavations, many monastic, around North London. He co-founded Mills Whip 
and architectural consultancy advising developers across the UK. He has continued his interest in the medieval and post-medieval sites with research when time permits. So, without any further ado, I'm going to invite you two gentlemen to come and talk to us on London Civil War Defences, Rewriting History. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction, and thank you very much for everybody who's attending here this afternoon. Um, we are going to start our talk with a, a brief roundup of the history of the Civil War. Um, rewriting history sounds rather bold, but I would hope in an hour's time you'll agree that you've got some merit in that claim. Anyway, um, Mike will be talking about the archaeology because he's been studying the archaeology, and so I've been looking at the documentary and cartographic evidence. Um, Putting my glasses on probably helps, so then I'll see what my own notes are. Okay. That's an interesting noise. Is that, oh, no, that's okay. Your oh, wait, first I'll, slide isn't up yet, but I did. why don't you just keep going while 45 minutes? That's not my first slide. There we go. Okay. Right. Off we go. We might as well start with the first yeah. slide anyway, so good. Excellent. Okay. Off we go. Right, a very brief summary of the Civil War. It began in 1642, finished in 1651. Basically, Charles fled with his family in January 1642 from London, and thereafter London stayed in the hands of Parliament. And both sides knew that ultimately whoever held London was going to win the war. And clearly they didn't end up with it. Initially, the war wasn't particularly active, but by the autumn of 1642, um, the first major battle took place at Edge Hill in October, which was rather a shock. And certainly to London, belatedly, defences were started to be arranged around London to principally looking at artillery routes into London. Small forts were erected at various outlandish places like Stoke Newington and Holloway Road and Marble Arch and places like that, way beyond London obviously. As the threats from the royal army diminished, um, a more considered set of defences were eventually erected. And in February 1643, Common Council, which was the authority in London, ordered the construction of a series of forts around London. We have the paper, the order that comes out for North London. South London was also defended, but that was not actually mentioned. The um, references for this whole period are remarkably sparse. We have a few bits and pieces from the Venetian ambassador who mentions various forts being built and the general saying how large the, the fortifications are, but no details. The most detailed information we've got is from a chap called uh, William Lithgow, who was a Scotsman who walked around the entire circuit in an anti clockwise manner. Um, and he recorded all the forts, all the cannons, um, right the way around, which it's odd on several levels that, A, he was a Scotsman because Scotland was a separate country with the same king, but its role in the Civil War was decidedly ambiguous at that point. Um, and they were arresting royalist spies on the outskirts of um, London who appeared to be taking a notes on the defences. So it seems very strange. This man was A, allowed to go around, and then he published what was actually there. And I think the simple answer was he was clearly either commissioned or was working with Common Council to provide propaganda, and that it was going to go to Oxford, where the king and his court were based, so that they would look at this stuff and mm. they would be thinking, you know what, it's maybe not such a bright idea to be attacking London at the moment. They seem to have an awful lot of cannons and an awful lot of men in place. In fact, uh, the, the Lithgow records something like 200 plus cannons in these various forts. And at the end of the war, when they were tallying them all up in the Tower of London, there were less than 100. So he was doing quite a successful piece of propaganda on part of the parliament. The defences were never tried by the royalists. They got as close as um, Turnham Green in November 42, which is about five miles from where we are this afternoon. But they were breached in 1647 by the New Model Army, Parliament's own army, under General Fairfax. And the first thing he did was to demolish the lines um, 
they had to be slighted. The one thing that is missing from all this is a map. Nobody has produced a map, which is very strange, considering how substantial these things were. And there seems to have been a collective amnesia for the sort of cartographers as to what was going on at that point. But suddenly in 1738, we have this from George Virtue. He was a notable um, engraver. He was engraver to the Royal Society. Um, he was highly regarded in all France. And he said that he had found this map and it was based on Holler. He re-engraved re something that Holler had done showing the um, fortifications. And this is where the tech gets me down. And tech, tech. The mouse. Yeah, well, that. never mind the mouse. We saw about this. Right, oh, we're on to the next slide. This is this is looking good, folks. This is looking good. Right, right. On the basis of um, virtue plus other research, um, a plan has been produced, and this is one from 1996 uh, from the excellent book by Stephen Porter on London and the Civil War, and it's sort of the template that's been worked on by archaeologists for many years now. But it's actually this is where we are likely to find the Civil War defences, and indeed in the area, particularly East London, both Mike and I, when we were working for the Museum of London, dug many holes around there looking for these defences and nobody ever found them. I mean, the general principle was we'd got this great ring of forts, some 12 miles, 18 kilometers, uh, joined by a, a massive ditch and rampart. And that's what we kept looking for. Um, but it didn't actually ever get found. Well, some of our colleagues who were rather keen on the Civil War, every time they found a ditch, they found Civil War defences. So it's kind of like, oh yeah, okay, here we go again, we've found Civil War defences. That was fine. About four years ago, we were contacted by a developer, as we're now consultants, um, looking at a site by number two. So if you can see number two there on the right-hand side. Um, they were looking to potentially buy the site, but they had been told by their agents that there was something called the Whitechapel Fort on the site. And the developer said to me, I've got two questions. A, is that true? And B, is it a problem? And I said, well, I can answer B right now. Yes, if you've got a Civil War Fort, you have got a major problem. Right, well, we'll check out, see whether it's the Whitechapel Fort. So we started looking at stuff and it became clear there was, a, there was something very, very anomalous going on. From the 18th century onwards, certainly, the Whitechapel Fort everybody was referring to was where number two is on that plan. But in the 17th century, it was clear it wasn't there. It was about, if I can get this thing here, about here. You can see that sort of about a five minute walk away nearer to the city. And both these appear to be forts. So there's two forts, and there shouldn't be two forts in those locations. It didn't make any sense. Um, the developer decided he wasn't going to buy the site because clearly it was a major, major issue potentially. So what happened was that um, we had an informal meeting with Barney Sloan, who's in Historic England, and we discussed with him, and he suggested we might put forward a project design for doing a pilot study, looking at what this might mean which we did, um, and we were sort of monitored very closely by Brian Kerr, who did a very good job trying to keep us on track. And the results were very, very surprising. It was, um, there was a big, big difference between what had been conventionally thought to be the locations of these defenses and where it appeared to be, they actually were. So on that basis, Historic England has very, very generously funded us to actually research the whole rest of the northern circuit. And the southern section has been staggeringly generously supported by Southwark and Lambeth Archaeological Excavation Committee in a, a joint issue. So we are covering the whole thing and trying to pull it all together. Um, our current school monitor is Jane Siddell, who's desperately trying, it's like herding cats looking after us too, I'm afraid. So it's, it's quite a fun. Um, part of the, the, the arrangements were that we'd, we'd be working with David Flinton, who is probably the most eminent um, military historian, certainly for London areas for this period. And our results are being processed kind of lifetime by Maria Medlicott of Place Services. So the stuff we're finding now, this isn't just a sort of academic, 
this is actually going into the planning process. So the planning archaeologists in London have a chance to actually be obsessing stuff now as we are working our way around the circuit. So it's kind of very, very positive as it were. We started off on a very simple level of thinking, well, you know, as from a historical basis, if you've got a, anything like received wisdom, you check your sources. And that's kind of what you do. So what's the main source? It's the Virtues Map. Right. Spoiler alert on this one, folks. <laughs> it's not what it seems. Right. All those red circles, those were open fields. We know that in 1658 because they're on Faithorn and Euclid's map. So he was faking this. Um, he was, we don't know why, but he was faking this. Um, we, We've, we've had great problems trying to work, work out the various reasons for it. The, the one thing that certainly seems clear is it probably wasn't financial. It's almost like he was just enjoyed doing it because um, he had form. I mean, he'd done this before. That at that period, in the sort of earlier part of the 18th century, three of the Agus map, the 1562 map, um, they hadn't been found at that point. Um, and Virtue suddenly found them. And he, said, oh, this is going to add. And for 150 years, as one very fed up historian noted in the late 19th century, he's misled us all. Oh, I think he's done even better on this one. For 300 years, basically, he's misled us all on this one. I mean, it really, really is. It's like, and it's not accidental. He was a very, very good engraver. And if you look at the, the sort of the details of this, he's deliberately coarsened it. It looks like it's fairly crude, 18th, um, 17th century woodcut. Um, he's trying to, like, like in the antiques trade, when you get a sort of dodgy piece of furniture, you distress it. Well, he's distressed this. He's deliberately made it look older than it was, sort of oldy-woldy. So it's like, great, so our, sort of the underpinning of where these things are is wrong. Okay, so we think, right, now by chance, we found this map. It may not look much, but it's very important. Um, to which it's, it's, it's a Dutch map. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the Dutch for Charlotte Foyder is, but there was a, a huge interest in the fire of London by the Dutch. Um, very quickly, if Mike's worried about my time, yeah. <laughs> um, there was, a, there was a, a, an agreement between the English and Dutch not to burn down each other's coastal towns because it's stupid. You burn down Felixstowe, we'll burn down Flushing. Done, right? But the English went and burnt down a Dutch town. They were very, very, very unhappy, and they were preparing for war. And then the word came through that London had been turned into an ashtray. And it was seen as this is the hand of God, a very sort of Calvinist view, and it would be actually impious to actually do any more punishment to the English. So a war was stopped by the fire of London, bizarrely. But as a result, there was tremendous interest in Holland about how bad was it? Was it really, really bad? And yes, <laughs> so there was this huge marker for these drawings. This is one of them. Now, in the, the map itself, that's not the important bit. At the, in the sort of latter part of the 17th century, the lines of communication, although they've been flattened by um, Fairfax, weren't utterly destroyed. They were still visible. And the city used them as a tax boundary. So you could either be inside where you had to pay one and six or whatever, and outside it was four pence. So everybody was quite keen to know where they lay in relation to that thing. And somebody just took this map and they got a pencil and they drew the line and they put some of the forts on. So it's as near as contemporary as we can possibly get. And I have played with the highlighting on this one. I hope you can see it a bit clearer there. And you see that pencil line running right the way through. Right, yeah, right through to that lot. And you see there's a couple of forts. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a fort there, there's Whitechapel, and up at the top, we've got a couple more, and so on. So suddenly we've got a proper structured line of where the, the lines of communication are going. So we we started tracking on that. This is this was key stuff to us. This actually got us going. And on the basis of this, then we started hitting, looking at, and re-examining all the other material that was to hand. So looking at looking at stuff which basically was all in public domain, but because we, we're archaeologists, not historians, we'd come over with a slightly different view. I mean, we had, we had no knowledge to cloud our judgment. So we might 
<laughs> so, so we were ugly, ugly. It's like, okay, so who says? So we were looking at this stuff and we were kind of finding stuff. But one of the key things we found straight almost straight away was whereas because of virtue, everybody assumed it was an enormous ditch and a rampart, like a vast univalate sort of hill fort going around London. In fact, it was a trench. Lines of communication is a very simple military term in the 17th century, right to the present day. They were trenches so that you could move messengers from one fort to another, musket balls, troops from one to another with relative safety. So it's a trench, flat bottom preferably, and the rampart as such, or parapet, is actually on the outside, on the enemy side. So they look more like a First World War trench than a sort of version of Maiden Castle. Is it? So that was kind of a big thing in the morphology. We also found details about the actual shape of the forts. Mike will go more into that when we're looking at the archaeological evidence. Because looking at the archaeology of this stuff, because Virtue had put the forts in the wrong place, people were excavating. And bizarrely, they were finding the forts. But because it was in the wrong place, they weren't seeing that they were actually the forts. So we've actually got the forts, I think, on three, four occasions where the forts have been found and not recognized. We've also found something which is interesting as a sort of broader landscape of war is our sort of term we're using at the moment, that the, the sort of impact of the defences was not just the line and the trench and the fort. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> being told, being told about time. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. It's, it's fine. I'd reckon on 15, so I'm almost there. Um, but the, the landscape of war, the basically the impact of making these fortifications that was straightforwardly devastating. The Common Council had required basically all the obstructions around the area, sort of called on sanitaire to be created. So all the trees were chopped down, all the hedges were chopped down, the ditches were filled in. That was level one. Level two was the construction of the forts themselves, which were enormous, and they required vast amounts of brick earth to be dug out. And not only the brick earth, because really, if you make a fort of sandy clay, which has got brick earth, is, you know, after winter, it's going to look like Swiss cheese. It's, it's going to have holes everywhere. So they sliced off all the turf for miles around to put all over the forts to basically protect the forts and stick the turf on the forts themselves. So the amount of damage caused was enormous. And it's actually shown up in the archaeological record, but it hasn't been recognized because nobody was looking for it. Whereas Mike's been looking at this stuff and it's there, it is actually recorded because the archeologists have been pretty good. It's there, but it's not been kind of pulled together as a thread. So we're hoping now as a result of our research, this will actually sort of finesse some of the research aims of looking at this landscape of war, which was vast. It must have been really shocking to Londoners that they went from what had been a fairly rural setting around their city to something which look, would look like the photographs of Passion Day. It would have been absolutely devastating. And finally, we did actually find some new bits, early days of this stuff. Um, the, the, the stuff on the, the left, Dane survey, I was given to, to chase this one by Barney Sloan, who came across a reference. Earlier, well, it was, I think it was June this year, um, in a 19th century catalogue of documents which said Danes, a survey of the forts. And uh, managed to track down where it came from, I've gone through it. It's absolutely stunning. It's basically a list of all the forts and a list of all the distances between them. I think, wow. <laughs> That's like, wow, wow, wow. The, the, it's not as straightforward as that. Um, what Danes was, was a land surveyor. And I think what he did the preliminary layout and then it was finessed by military engineers during the course of that summer, because we know the building was still going on because Lithgow tells us that. So he laid out the first stuff and he puts the distances there. But nonetheless, what we've got here is an extraordinary, I think unique document that has now come to light, which is defining how these things were actually built. And the other one is um, David Flinton was given this by a, a sort of fellow researcher and he passed on. It was just an extract that somebody came across. 
I assume there's more of it because we've not seen any more of it, which is a list of the amount of pay being paid out to gunners in the various forts. So you can see at the top there, Gravel Lane, Whitechapel, and so on. So Shoreditch, Pimlico, Mount Mill, with the amounts of money, and it varies. And I'm sure from a historian, historian's point of view, this stuff is going to be extraordinary because I'm sure this actually interlinks with as the wages ebb and flow of these soldiers. That probably can be linked in with things that are happening within London or threats to London at the time. So suddenly there's more soldiers needed. On that, right, yeah, we're there, we're there, don't worry, don't worry, don't panic. Okay, so on the basis of forts, we'll now look at the forts, okay, folks. Right, here we are. Now we're gonna go around anti-clockwise, uh, following Lithgow, don't panic, we're not gonna look at all those. Now, could, could you give us um, a laser point instead of the cursor on here, please? Thank you. Okay, we've now got a red alien in the middle of the map. Anyway, okay, whopping. We're going to start there. Lithgow said it's in the right on the, the shore, it's in the middle of the town. And you can see there the distance between where it's said to have been in the past and where we think it's like to be, given the evidence we, now we've been dealing with. Finally, Mike, <coughs> we'll have a go. Oh, I'm right. sorry, this one, sorry, DeWitt. We've got DeWitt there. You can see the DeWitt sort of coming through. There's a little line coming down, running down there, coming down to this island site. Okay. Finally, we get to some archaeology. Okay, so this is the middle of that island site you've just been looking at. This is Wapping High Street. Going up here, we have Wapping Dock Road. Uh, and if you can look very carefully at this, this rises up with the gravel terrace, which is a normal rise, but it's a there's a little bit of a hump here. And we feel, we think that that is the remnants of the artillery bastions, foundations, which were leveled, but still left a bit in. And so that hump we think belongs to the Wapping Fort. Now, in 2008, the Museum of London did archaeological excavations here. Wapping Dock Road is just here that we've just been looking at. So these excavations are behind this building, and these are the two shafts that they were excavating as part of the East London line. Um, shaft one here, we had two large cut features. This is the one that interests us. It's slightly later, uh, and it has an oak revetment against it. From the fill, we found pottery and clay pipe that dated 1640 to 1660. So this puts us in the middle of the 17th century. So this, this is the right date range for the Civil War. Also, shaft two, we had brick walls and the brick foundations, and we had a brick floor. The brick floor, Molas dated, that's the Museum of London, dated to 1640 to 1660. So here we have mid 17th century material dating to the Civil War. We have what we think is the base of an artillery platform here. We have Peter's uh, um, cartographic evidence as well. And I think if you put them all together, we've got a reasonable case for saying that the Wapping Fort lies just south of Cinnamon Street and to the east of um, Wapping Dock Street. Okay. okay. And we're on to the next one. Okay, on my right to the next one. This is sort of uh, the White Chapel in the Royal London where it all kicked off because there's two things next to each other. As you can see, it's a pretty big difference for where those lines of communication. So when Mike and I were digging holes looking for that black line, and it was actually where the red line is, you can see why we weren't finding anything. Um, it's substantial. We'll look at the, the White Chapel one first, the, 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 the new one, as it were, the red one which is actually kind of hiding in plain sight, faith on a new court, it's there. And you can see here the bastions around the windmill, which is recorded by Common Council. And it's also on the DeWitt map in a sort of bit of a festoony type way. Archaeology. Oh, okay. Um, here we are, this is Whitechapel High Street. That road going south from it is Plumbers Row. This is, um, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry, a beautiful uh, 18th century building. Here it is. Now, the thing that I want you to look at is if you follow the wall line down here, there's a really strange kink about there. 
Uh, and then if you look at this drawing here, Roke, there's a strange kink there. This we think is probably reflecting the outline of the southern bastion of, of the Whitechapel fort, uh, which then has been reflected in this building here. And Jeff Potter in 2019 uh, with Compass Archaeology ex sorry, excavated uh, within, <laughs> within that building and they found reasonably good archaeological preservation. They found some quarry pits and large pits dating to the mid 17th century. And within one of the fills, they came across this pipe clay miniature of a cannon. And uh, our joke is that it's not smoking gun evidence, but it's kind of quite fun. But the thing is, there's quite a good archaeological survival uh, in, within this building. And we think if we do some more archaeology work in this area, we may find evidence for uh, the Civil War defences for the Whitechapel fort. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, meanwhile, we've got the other one, the Royal London Hospital, um, which was the one that kicked off our inquiries in the first place. And we say, here it is, obviously, plainly on the Hol Hollers panorama. It's actually down in this bit here. We do the detail. You can see in the background there, a very, very substantial fortification which looks like it's seven bastion, was ex extraordinarily ornate. None of the other London forts show anything like that. They're very simple sort of quadrangles. This looks much more sophisticated and much more organized um, with a very substantial building. There is no indication on any of the maps I've seen or documentary evidence that this is existence before 1647. Now, uh, you may recall, I said that 1647, General Fairfax invaded London with the New Model Army, and he levelled the defences. The Venetian ambassador records that he also set to lay the foundations of three great citadels to bridle London. And I think what we may have here is one of those citadels. So that is a phenomenal breakthrough terms of the defences and the history of London in the 17th century. And we've got it there as a picture. And it's not just on Holland, it survived until actually quite late on to the 19th century. It's there on Wren, you can see that, that drawing of Wren, sort of the top left drawing, um, that's effectively a drawing that was done for a planning application of the day. And it's the court is one of the, the um, place marks for it. Um, Roke shows it the Whitechapel Mount and it's, it became a rubbish dump, and Virtue saw the Whitechapel Mount and thought that's the Whitechapel Fort, which is where his big error came, why he ended up with the lines of communication 400 metres out of where they ought to be. And you can see from the Chatelain engraving at the bottom, the thing was enormous. I mean, it was, it was a huge lump by that point. It was a very, very big thing indeed. Anyway, there we go. That's the Whitechapel. That's what kicked it all off. And there's even some archaeology. Okay, um, this slide here, this is Whitechapel Road now, not High Street. We're about a few hundred meters to the east of the Bell Foundry we've just been looking at. Going to the south here, this is New Road. What we're looking at is this area behind this tree here. Uh, and what I want to show you is this is the level of the car park uh, in front of Mount Terrace. Uh, and this is the ambient ground level by the road and the pavement here. Difference is about a meter. And what this represents is the remains of the Whitechapel Mount, which was leveled by petition to government in 1805. Uh, this is the remnants of it. The citadel that's, that Halifax may have built there in 1647, long gone, but the remains of the Whitechapel Mount is still there. Uh, and that, that's the important thing about this, this particular area. Okay, briefly, then briefly we're on to Brick Lane, basically, a uh, common council that said we uh, want to fork between Whitechapel and Shoreditch. Bang, we got a Brick Lane in the middle. And guess what? From the archaeological perspective. Okay. Um, so in 2007, Mola excavated this. All right, let me get this right. This is Brick Lane here. Um, no. Um, this is Brick Lane here. And just to the east, uh, there's one of the stanchions for a new railway bridge that Mola excavated. This is the stanchion and these are the results of the excavation and the two blue lines here represent uh, what the excavator said were gullies but look like small small ditch type cuts. 
they're about 0.6 meters uh, in, in, in width, uh, a couple of feet apart and so on and so forth. Anyway, the, the, the thing is about this, it introduced a, a, a whole new characteristic for the civil war defenses where some of the smaller redoubts, the smaller forts and, and the defensive units that were offering surveillance against the main artillery routes, um, art, arterial routes in and out of London, had these small forts that were defended by um, twin um, ditches. Uh, David Papillon, who was writing in London in 1645 uh, in a contemporary review of defensive engineering works in his military manual states, your great ditch being 20 foot broad is far safer than these small double ditches having a bank of earth, some two foot broad left between them, used and erected about the London redoubts. Um, and what became apparent when we were going through the historic environment records for a massive study area with, with these twin, these double parallel ditches were cropping up. We're going to see one next in about 750 meters further to north at Hoxton, and they became fairly ubiquitous with the whole um, Civil War defences. This seems to be, for some reason, a characteristic of Civil War defences in London. We don't really know why, because they don't look particularly, and David Flintham, I don't think, thinks they're particularly a great idea, neither does Papillon, but this is what they seem to be doing. Um, okay, let's have a okay. go to Hoxton. Right, and we now move furthermore up to the Hoxton Fort. Um, as Mike said, it's a sort of a, an area where more has been revealed. As you see, it's getting slightly chaotic here from the black stuff, which everybody was pursuing and excavating on, to the red stuff, which is where the documentary and cartographic evidence would actually suggest the forts lie. As you can see there on DeWitt, we've got the Hoxton Fort on the left, right into the sort of corner of that junction. And behind the housing, we've got the Shoreditch Fort. Mike. Okay. Excavations in 2001 by Mola. Right. The thing about this slide is this is the A10 Kingsland Road here. Um, Old Street is down at the bottom, Drysdale Street is at the top there. Um, this, uh, this evaluation done by Mola was just on the eastern, uh, on the western side of the major arterial road run, road, route running north-south. Um, and again, we've got these twin ditches coming up here. Um, the larger of the two ditches was dated 1630 to 1650. Also in 1993, Mola did some excavation works down here and recorded a number of uh, quite large pits. They were mostly dated to 1640 to 1660. So we've got a fairly busy mid 17th century um, area in, in just behind the A10. Uh, the double ditches were probably defense, defending a redoubt that was offering surveillance to the major arterial route here, the A10 going north south. And we're going to look at a couple more of these about a kilometer to the west uh, in, in, in a minute. It's the same sort of thing. Okay. Oh my God, on to Mount Right, this is Mount Bill. Um, this is now we're heading into Islington area. A fantastically lovely cartoon, I think, showing the fortification. Um, the mount started as a rubbish dump and was in the 15th century, and it got so large, somebody was able to build a windmill on it, which blew over, which was replaced by a chapel, which then was demolished by Henry VIII, which then was replaced by another windmill, which was then requisitioned by the army for the Civil War defences. As you can see, it's basically the windmill lost its sails by that point, and then there were circuits of defensive armaments round about. Again, this is almost certainly sort of reflecting an element of propaganda. So whoever was seeing this think, well, that looks fairly intimidating. As you can see, that sort of small feature there, this little pepper pot thing, that is probably a small fort, which Mike will talk about in a moment. Over at the top there, we've got a circular feature filled with water, surrounded by water, and that is the new riverhead, which was the reservoir built in the early 17th century for supplying water to London, which is then converted into a fort um, for the purposes in phase two defenses. And this kind of zigzag line around here, I don't know if it's artistic license or there was some sort of outer defense of some sort to the fort itself. We're, we're not sure on that. Um, we're over to the archeology span 
This road here is the A1, Goswell Road, um, another of the major arterial routes north and south in and out of London, about a kilometer to the west of the A10. This is the artillery bastion down here, the actual Fort Mount Mill itself, about 150 meters further to the north. We have Sebastian Street here where excavations were done by Mola over quite a period from 2018 to 2019. Um, and also some excavations done at King Square where some other features were found. These. This is A1 Goswell Road here. So this is the major route and you can just see to the west and, and fairly close to it, we have a uh, Mola recorded double ditch situation. This may well be the return of this green ditch here. So we're probably looking at something which may have been square, that sort of shape. Again, you can see the size of the ditches. It, it, it's this double figure cor, um, configuration that crops up time and time again. In, in the ground, this is what they look like. The, the sort of yellowy stuff is the brick earth. This is the, the drift geology, the bottom of the archeological sequence. The, the, the top of it has been truncated away um, and cut into it from a higher land surface, which was then quarried away. We have these two black lines and these are in actual fact, the ditches. The quarry that, that was, was then backfilled here, this is probably great fire debris that's been dumped over the top of these two ditches. So it sort of dates them quite nicely to the mid 17th century. So you put a, a section through this ditch here and this is what it looks like. That is the brick earth at that side. There's more brick earth here. The ditch itself is running from left to right. So the ditch is going that way, cut into this brick earth. And at the bottom of the ditch, we've got this oak planking. We're not sure if it was actually up against that particular side or if it fell down, we're not sure. But this is what these um, double ditches look like when you actually dig them up in the ground. Right, on to the new river head, which was a, a structure completed in 1613 as a reservoir and to the north of it, um, Fort the Angel. And here you, again, you can see the previously um, located things and the present ones as we put them. And Islington Pound is where Virtue came a cropper. Um, what Virtue didn't realize the word pound in the mid 17th century meant pond as well as pound. And he thought it was the animal pound. So he stuck it out on Islington Green, which even he realized was a major problem for where you could actually have the lines of communication to work together. What we've got there is the new river head, which was like the, an earlier structure, which was then turned into um, a fortification. Lithgow mentions a fort at Waterfield, which may not be far away from where that black one is, is, is in the light of the Danes thing, which um, I mentioned at the beginning. We've not had a chance to analyze that. I only sort of got to look at it about three months ago. It covers the entire circuit in some considerable detail. It looks like there was at least one other ancillary fort, and there was possibly also a derelict windmill, which was used as part of fortification. So you have this sort of defensive cluster hub, where it's serial fortifications, obviously interlinked and sort of working together to provide cover for a particular area. And both those roads coming down that sort of V there, we've got what's now called the Liverpool Road and um, Upper Street. There, there, is a, there is major, major routes up to the north of England and potentially you could have invading armies coming down there. So there needed to be substantial fortifications there. And good old Holler, who was almost like a slightly royalist spy, I think, he seems to be putting an awful lot of detail onto his drawings very carefully. Um, he includes it on his panorama. And this time, behind St. Paul's, we have got a fort at the top of the angel. You can see a very, very substantial fort with a central building and a flag. It looks like the flag of St. George. And below that, we've got the, the new riverhead with the water tower, which was a tall structure. And possibly behind that is this reference to a derelict mill or windmill, which may have been also used as some sort of uh, spotting thing. And it's still there. That's a fantastic. Thanks to Mr. Google. If you look on, go online, um, that reservoir, despite the depredations and things of modern, relatively modern buildings, you can see this that semicircle is still the last remnants of the fort, which is one of the few areas probably in London they've still got something where you can look through the gate. If you stand here 
Rosebery Avenue, you look down there, you can actually see part of effectively the 17th century fort still there in situ. It's quite fun. Okay, the next bit is um, this lines of communication where there's obviously a kink, and it's sort of included this because this was mentioned by Rosemary Weinstein in her excellent article on civil war defences in Camden years ago. And this is, as far as I know, the only contemporary map of the lines of communication. And the kink, people have suggested it might be because there was an important landowner owns the land to the north. I don't think that's the case. In fact, what we've got here, this line here, is in fact a parish boundary. And you can see there is a stream. And what happened here, you can see on sort of later maps, this is a great big pond. And I think in a very practical sense, in Dane's measurements between the forts, this is a straight line from there, Southampton Fort up to Gray's Inn, and that measurement is straight. He didn't take account of topographic problems, which were facing the actual guys who were building this stuff. And they came to this marsh and they thought, well, are we gonna actually try and bridge the marsh or whatever? And they just worked around it. And there's another instance in Mayfair area where exactly the same thing has happened. That the lines of communication are actually, they needed them quickly. They couldn't afford to be fancy. They couldn't afford to drain marshes or build around quarries or anything like that. So they just went around them and then went back to as near as straight as possible so that the lines would continue. Right, now we're coming to the lines of communication between Southampton House and Crabtree Fort. Um, I'm not going to say too much about well, anything really about Southampton Fort. It's well known and it's on maps. It survived to the 19th century. Obviously, you have very limited time and you can't go through all the things. It it's, looks like one of the properly designed forts. Um, David Flinton said it's the only one that looks like it was properly designed. Anyway, we'll leave that one. But the interesting thing the lines of communication, the next phase, um, those areas were examined by pre constructed archaeology and from a map point of view, we do have a little map provided by Holler, which shows clearly that the lines come south from this bastion of the fort, um, whereas the PCA excavation, we thought they'd got the lines of communication. Um, we think it might be something else, but over to Michael now. These are photographs of the PCA 2007 excavation. Start with this one. Here we're looking west, so east to west here. This is the, the, the major cut here, uh, ditch cut. It was 3.9 to nine meters wide, uh, quite deep with a V-shaped uh, profile. You can see the fills here. This is an interesting photograph here because what this shows is what Lithka, what Peter was talking about earlier on with the landscape of war and how the infrastructure project that was the Civil War defense uh, defences blighted the land. In this area here, PCA recorded that the, the pasture, the soils that represented the pasture, the fields that were just north of the mid 17th century city had been um, dug out. The turf that was above them had been taken away. It's quite a useful material to use in uh, the Civil War defences, revealing at the bottom the, the natural brick earth. Uh, on which the, uh, the agricultural soil sat. And these striations here are, are wheel ruts uh, from carts that were dragged back and forth across the, uh, this, this area here. And the interesting thing is that this shows you the sort of uh, effects that the Civil War's defences were having on the immediate periphery around the mid 17th century city. Um, Lithgow writes in May of 1643, when the major initiative of fort building and defense and the lines of communication was, was going on. He says, it grieves me to see that so many rich grounds of grass utterly spoiled with the erection of these works insomuch that horse and cattle certainly will come short of their food there for seven years and the owners thereof must fall pitifully short of their yearly profits, uh, and so on and so forth. So it kind of reminds you of kind of HS2 uh, and so on and so forth. When I was um, working on the Channel Tunnel rail link section one, which goes from Folkestone to London, 
huge swathes were cut through the fields of Kent for that particular rail track. And on a smaller scale, the same thing was happening with this defensive infrastructure project on the periphery of the mid 17th century city. Oh. Now, 10 years after these fortifications were built, Dane, John Danes drew this map in 1657. And what it shows is, this, this is the excavation area that uh, PCA dug. Uh, and this here and this thing going down here are ditches. So it shows that the, the pasture land has been regenerated after a period of several years and is now viable again. Um, later on, 18 years later than this, Montague House would be built in this plot here. It's garden walls respecting these boundary lines, these boundary ditches here. So the, the land had recovered. Uh, okay. Right, pressing on. Oxford Circus, because we're moving ever westwards. Um, a very complicated set of fortifications here. As you can see, it, there was a main fort, which was this one here at Oxford Circus. There was a redoubt was here, and we know from Danes there was a hornwork somewhere. The two black circles are actually these ones over here, Bond Street, as it were. They've been sort of misplaced. But the result is of the, the lines of communications, then the angle changes radically, which has an impact further down the line. The remains of the thing of the fort are actually shown, and the Oxford Circus Fort are actually shown on Faithful and New Court. And you see here's a substantial building. And see, it's like the substantial building that was in the middle of the, the possible citadel, the substantial building in the middle of the Angel Fort. These buildings were well built, they were the barrack blocks. And this one is there with apparently an earthwork around it. And I think this may be the northern half of the fort. The fort itself actually crossed Oxford Street. Tyburn Road, as it were. So there seems to be a, re, a reuse of these buildings, because clearly if you've got a well-built structure and the war has ended, these buildings are still useful and they get used. We're going to move swiftly westwards to Mount Street and down to Park Lane, where, as you can see on this one, we've got a kink again. Because of the realignment, the kink, which is on a map, as we'll see in a moment, actually means the previous alignment varies and what we think we've got here is that the, the kink goes round a quarry and it leads down to a small fort at Park Lane which I think is probably part of the general cluster of fortifications around Hyde Park which I think is very much down to more or less where it says F24 on that on that slide and you can see here on this rare map of Desmarais in 1717 I hope you can see anyway You've got Oliver's as Mount, as it's called. Um, that's there. And we've got the lines of communication coming down here, down here, down here, and down here. And then it stops. This is rough ground, possibly quarry. And here we've got a small square structure, which I think is this over here. It's two slightly different views. It's fantastic. Sketch done by Holler of Hyde Park for again. You know, I do wonder if he was a bit of a royalist spy. He does seem to draw quite a lot of the fortifications, which his patron was the Earl of Arundel, who was a royalist who had very discreetly disappeared off to the continent to not get involved in the war. But I think that's we've got another small fort there, and I think that's um, a nice bit of stuff to be pulling together. You'll be relieved to know we're now doing solid south of the river. Uh, so we're not doing the bit in between, but there is the bit, I would say, this, see this triangle here? That's Buckingham Palace Garden, as far as I can see, just by preliminary scan. I think there's at least two forts in there. So we might have a word with the present tenant to see yeah, if there's any chance of doing <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so it. Right. That's, that's going to be the final bit we do. Okay, Vauxhall, down here, down to Vauxhall. Um, Again, more complicated than it had originally thought. There was a main fort, which is now underneath the railway line. You think, well, that's that. Not necessarily. We've been involved in a big project at Hollywell Priory, where very substantial chunks of the Priory have survived under the railway viaduct. So I don't think it's perfectly possible we could have the traces of the fort there. There was a redoubt. There was certainly a blockhouse as well somewhere. Nine Elms is another fort again. 
it's a very complicated business. Um, and also, as you can see, the lines of communication themselves are slightly further west than thought. Good old Desmaritz, his map, you can see there that sort of quadrant fort down there, which is very accurately placed. And up here, although we haven't looked at it, Tothill Fields, that looks to me, that appears to be the location of the Tothill Fields Fort. And there's a very large building there, which one record actually says was built in the Civil War. So I think we may have another one of these Barrett blocks. This one then was adapted and was turned into almshouses in the 18th century. Moving on to St. George's um, in Southwark, which is by the Imperial War Museum. A slightly different location to the previous one, and Newington Butts, which gave rise to Elephant and Castle as a name. That was originally Oliver's Castle, and the 17th century an elephant was called an Oliphant. So it sort of got elided one way or another, so it turned into Elephant and Castle. We will have some more elephants later on in the Hive as well. And it survived as a landscape feature, even into Roke. And you see at the center there is the Dog and Duck, which was a tavern got notorious later on. It's first recorded in 1652 on a trading token as a pub. By that point, the forts have been shut down. And I'm absolutely certain it's another one of these Barrett blocks, which some entrepreneurial person has actually moved and thought, you know what, we'll have that building and turn it into a boozer. And that's exactly what's happened. Archaeology as well. In support of Peter's theory of the location of the St. George's Fort, um, this is a plan of the Imperial War Museum on the western side in 2001. Mola, we're doing a watching brief on a number of service cuts and service trenches. And during that process, they came across some more of our double ditches here and here. The, uh, the dating isn't that secure. Yeah, there is the, the only dating we've got is, is actually 16th century, but in terms of relative dating, it's underneath the floor slab and cut into the natural. So they are placed in roughly the right area. They look like the normal uh, double defensive ditches that we found elsewhere. This is what Pete's drawn, and these ditches would lie somewhere in this area here. But the interesting thing is here is that we've got large open space here and here, which means the potential for doing, doing geophysical surveys is jolly good. They, there won't be too much background noise, so we might get some reasonably okay results. So we could actually, what we call ground truth, the idea of there's a bastion in this area using geophys. So that, that would be quite exciting in the, the coming years. Okay, just, just very briefly, um, look, this is, I th and faith on new courts. I think it's actually a checkpoint for the Civil War defences because the survey was done between 1643 and 47. And uniquely, I think we've got the barricades across and possibly sentry boxes to actually show where the entrance was. Kent Street is the next one. Um, on what's now the old Kent Road, pretty much. As you can see, quite different alignment from where it's previously been thought to be. Pulling together two sets of maps, Morgan, there was a big sort of um, reluctance of cartographers in the, under the Stuart monarchy to actually show anything to do with the Civil War because it normally needed royal passion. It was obviously extremely bad manners to be pointing out things where, particularly in London, where the monarch, the Stuart the monarch, had had his head cut off. Um, so they very coyly do bits and pieces. So Morgan, you can see there's a small L shaped waterfield feature here. Roke has got, off. that's then been filled in. Roke, who goes further south, actually shows something there. And you put the two together and you end up with a bastion shaped thing next to the lock hospital, which was exactly where it said the fort bastion was. And that's what it looks like now. Um, not all of South London looks like that. Some of it's very attractive. But the, the fort is about where the purple bin is. And it's Mike's point about it's survival the, is like to be... It's the north end of the A2. There you go. He used to live in South London. Um, it's, it's obviously a reasonably good chance of actually survival for something in that area. Bermondsey, um, it's just by the Grange, as it was the medieval Grange, and possibly the Grange buildings were used as part of the structure for the fort and possibly the precinct wall was still upstanding enough. 
probably to the sort of some contemporary drawings of the sort of 19th century, so it could still be there. Fort Lane, that field, the, the sort of key thing is actually the damage done, which back to the landscape of war and Cecil, the Cecils were on the side of parliament and they're still, their lands were ransacked to an extraordinary degree. And I think you see the numbers of the trees being chopped down. There's 200 great elms and the willows and 200 acres of fencing. And I think the reason for that may be very simple, but where Bermondsey Fort is to Rotherhithe, everywhere else, all the documentary references refer to trenches. This bit, they don't. They just say, you go from here to there. It's a marsh. If you try and dig a trench through there, you'll have a canal in 20 minutes. You will not have a trench. And I, I'm a total guess. I'm wondering whether they took all that timber and then what they made was a palisade and they had a corduroy track of some sort. So they needed an awful lot of timber to provide safety for the troops potentially going between Bermondsey and Rotherhithe. And clearly it's a long stretch along the riverfront, which you could not leave open or undefended. There had to be something between there and there to actually deter royalist attacks. We knew there was a royalist attack planned from Seven Oaks at one point. They had to be very careful. Right, last four, you'd be a relief. So here we are, Rotherhithe, it's on the waterfront. It's shown, I think, on my faithful Newcourt as a fortified quayside, and even more so on Sandlin. And I think this is, it's a, not a conventional fort. It was, they had to have a, something where you could actually get stuff delivered one way or another, and it would have been straightforward get in there, deliver stuff, and you've got canners to provide safe cover for the river. And there's even a bit of archaeology. Nineteen ninety-seven, um, the Museum of London excavated two vent shafts uh, about a hundred meters to the east of those plans that Peter was was showing you. And and basically, what they discovered from this was how dynamic the revetments for the river frontage were in this period. We have one 1600 to 1630, 1650, and then another one at 1750. The middle one may well relate and be similar to the ones that Peter was showing you in the earlier maps over here. It was made from um, oak uprights with softwood planking, which is basically reused river vessel wood timber, um, dated it was sunk into some sandy silt material that was dated to 1650. Um, so it's sort of roughly mid 17th century and is probably contemporary with the, the maps that Peter previously showed you. Right, so that's all the bits we've done so far. This is what we're going to do in the next bit. So this fantastic drawing of Hyde Park with the fort and the little park lane fort on this side, just to finish off the results as it were. Um, first of all, I think the points of what we've achieved so far, uh, I think it was quite a breakthrough to demonstrate that um, virtue was a fraud, is that it's still, it's still appearing in publications to this day. Um, that was a big breakthrough. I think, as you can see, that almost all the forts have been relocated. All the lines of communication have been relocated. We now know from a morphological point of view these were trenches, not ditches. So people need to be looking for the right thing. Instead of thinking every time to find a large ditch, they've got the civil war defences. No, they haven't. It's a ditch. It ain't, it ain't the civil war defences. That we've now established with the archaeology and the, the mentioned by Papillon that double ditches, particularly these small double ditches, are a characteristic of London forts, which are almost diagnostic. So if you start getting double ditches anywhere as an archaeologist, you Talking and it's mid 17th century, and you think, what's this going on? And I think the fact we've identified a landscape of war, so there's a broader area of damage around these fortifications, which means that where there's areas archaeologically can demonstrate where there's been deturfing, there seems to be shallow digging, there's been rapid infilling of ditches for some reason, these could be part of a broader landscape which goes with the Civil War. And I think finally, the fact we've got, I think, potentially a citadel for Fairfax of 1647 identified is a major breakthrough as well. So it sounds slightly boastful at the beginning, so we're rewriting history. I think we've made a good stab, maybe on a very small level. Anyway, thank you for your patience. I hope you enjoyed it a bit. <laughs>
But my time had run out. I don't know. <laughs> How long is this? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> wow, fascinating. And that sort of, and the, the, the reworking of the walls at the end, beautifully pulled together. <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions and comments. And uh, maybe we could start to see if we have anybody in the room um, who has any questions to ask people. Simple ones, please. <laughs> Um, is there any uh, documentary evidence of the, or other evidence of the labour input to actually build these defences? Were they done by soldiers? Were they done by civilians? I mean, is, is there any record of how they were actually constructed? There is actually. Um, there's, there was considerable amount on that. I didn't, obviously, we're a bit limited on the amount of time we can go through, but it was kind of extraordinary. Everybody in London turned out. Um, For the first uh, phase. For, 1642. No, 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 no. And later on, the second one as well. No, they went right through. They had everybody. It, it got organized so that you had everybody, and even the sort of cavaliers were joking about, even basically the ladies of the streets were coming out giving their hand as well. Everybody was out. And then you've got the grand ladies were coming. Then it was organized that one morning it would be the bakers, then it would be the butchers, then the candlestick makers. So it then became less chaotic. It sounded like everybody was piling in. There's like, well, who's got a shovel? So they're all milling around. Eventually, then, okay, you've got the picks today, we've got the shovels, you know, and it got organized. And the Venetian ambassador said, they're even working on Sundays, which is like the day off, you know. What? You know, the Puritans are not supposed to do that's, you know, that's that's not on. They were saying this was their enthusiasm. So it really was. From the end of February to Lithgow is saying they're just finishing stuff off. By the end of May, they'd managed to do 12 miles of these enormous earthworks, plus all the falls. It was, it was an immense undertaking. People have also been looking at the accounts and the, accounts and the uh, payments to various people involved, which can also help to build the picture of how the defences were constructed and how much money was spent here and there and so on and so forth. So that, that, that also adds to the sort of documentary research uh, evidence. Annabel, we have, we have one online. How effective do you think these defences would have been had they actually been actively tested? They weren't defences. That's the thing. This is not like a big castle wall where you'd have chaps every five yards with a gun. They were meant to move between each other. The defences were really the forts, and those forts were what was defensive. A lot of it was theatre, that, that, that from an external point of view, the royalists were sending spies out, looking at these things, and they looked huge. But the reality was, when Fairfax marched down, he marched straight in. Nobody was going to stop. You know, they were like, you can't do it. A lot of this was show, and the royalists it was bluff as much as anything. Whether any of these forts could have stood longer than a couple of days if they'd been seriously attacked, I doubt, because when you did have properly defended forts, because as Mike's been saying, you know, the, these double ditch things around were, were ridiculous. They, they weren't going to actually help defences. It was like somebody had read a book on we need a double ditch around the fort, but it was meant to be 20 feet wide according to the manuals, and they did one two feet wide. It's like, this is this not going to work. He's not going to stop Rupert of the Rhine and the rest of his cavalry with that. The, the lines of communication for troop movements. The, the lines of communication were, were to yeah. facilitate troop movements rather than defend. Yeah, so, so. we've got, we've got the, the forts in the sense that those were there, but the idea that the sort of the circuit was some defensible thing wouldn't have been on because obviously you need hundreds of thousands of troops to actually defend something like that size. But good good point, good point. Um, any development due to take place along the revised lines? There, well, that is more for some of the other people in the room who will know more about the planning applications come in, who are the planning archeologists, but certainly we're aware of stuff here and there where it looks like there are going to be developments which be potentially of interest and clearly, would watch those with a great deal of interest. And Mike sort of alluded to the idea, possibly, you know, if we get ourselves a bit organized, it would be good to me maybe fingering various areas where we could have geophysical investigations to check out because these things were so big, 
they cross various bits of like Hyde Park, there's various London squares where there are likely to be remains which have been undamaged since the 17th century. So it's all, it's, it will be there, I suspect. My query is about place names. Are place names of any help? I, yes, in a word. <laughs> um, I mean, will it be mentioned in Victoria? I, do, I think that that's, that relates to the artillery ground that was there slightly later on. Um, but nonetheless, that's a very fair point because there are several of the um, areas where the, uh, the Royal London Hospital, for instance, where the, the mound is still there. It was, it's still called Mount Terrace, and it was Mount Street behind it, which has since been demolished. So Mount seems to be a key word. Mount Street and Mount Mews in Mayfair, likewise, where there's the Mount Fort. So there are some linkages still. Um, the very interesting article that was in Stephen Porter's book about the London Civil War, they, I, I understand their enthusiasm. So lots of pubs called like the castle and the fort and things like that. So and so far, we've not had any evidence that those actually link up, that they were more 19th century inventions of going with military expeditions, maybe the British Army at the time or something like that. But it's you never ignore place name evidence. I think it's very, very important. I think archaeologists ignore it at their peril. Uh, thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, do you think we've got a problem of scale? Um, you know, when you look at extant civil war fortifications, if you think of uh, the classic Queen's sconce at Newark, yeah, it's a massive structure. Yeah, we're digging mostly little keyhole trenches and test pits into the something. If you dig it into something like that, into the you, you're going you're going to see something I think that looks like a quarry, and we see a lot of quarries around. Indeed. Are we misinterpreting some things as, uh, as I, that I, are actually the big defences are as quark boring quarries? I think you're actually right. I think I mean it's the the problem was that you how can you tell that it's perennial? If you get a steeply sided cut, what have you got? And you're doing a trial trench. It's extremely difficult, I would say, and it's it's a question of obviously from your point of view, Sandy, that you know how to get into the, the, the majority of the the excavation works that we've been looking at tend to be evaluations, so they're, they're trenches and trial pits that we've been talking about, and they the problem that they produce is that it's difficult to get absolute dating, even relative dating, because the areas that you're looking at are quite small. Feature identification is 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 also very difficult. Half the time, if you have a linear ditch, one half of the ditch is actually beyond the limit of excavation. So you don't know if it's a quarry or a ditch. So yeah, it, it, it is a major, major difficulty for us. So, so our interpretations have to be a little bit general and we have to be able to say that this is what we think it is. We can't, you know, in, in many occasions, we can't actually definitely identify the feature. Thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time, I'm being advised, and so um, we can continue the discussion maybe um, in, the, in the other room. So, um, so if I could just ask you to join with me in thanking our speakers once again for a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 26th of October, 2023, when we will hear a paper, The Athenaeum Club, A History by Michael Wheeler. The meeting stands adjourned and a reception will follow.